Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And welcome to our joint Water Pavilion and Resilience Hub event. So we'll be hearing about accelerating action in water resilience in cities and the built environment. And we have a, a mixture of online speakers and panelists uh, and some videos to help shape the session today. So we'll be looking at the role of cities and utilities in accelerating that action. And for those who've been following COP, you will have heard much about the impacts of climate change. And much of that will be felt through water. Too much, too little, too polluted. So it's really exciting to have the Water Pavilion together with the Resilience Hub. They work hand in hand together in shaping an urban water resilient future for all of us. My name is Martin Schuler from Arab, and uh, I'm, it's a great ple pleasure to be here. And we're going to start off with a, a video from Cape Town. it's shifting how we've always done things. And that's what pulled us through. If we hit, if we hit day zero, I think that would have been a, an absolute catastrophe. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, you know, when you're thinking about as a business, not only how do you supply your, your workers with water when they're there, or even how do you run your office or your production processes, but are your employees going to be standing in queues for hours for water? What does that do for productivity? Are there going to be massive riots and protests and they're not even going to be able to get to the, to the, to the, um, to the building or the office? The key learning lesson of 2017 was, was that we couldn't depend on the normal standard uh, historic rainfall data that we would normally receive because climate change had, you know, made that completely unreliable. Going forward, much of our planning has to happen within a climate, a climate of complete unpredictability. You need to work with the people. You know, you, you, you need find, to find ways of how then do you work with the, with the, with the people that you are servicing. You know, also that kind of comes with other kind of uh, unforeseen uh, challenges because we also have uh, uh, needs, uh, competi competition of needs as well as people. But for me, you need to be visible. Make sure to communicate immediately and with as much information as you can. People need to know, they need to feel in a time of crisis that you are the voice of authority, so you need to establish yourself as the voice of authority. You need to say as much as you can say, as soon as you can say it. Mandates and responsibilities sit at different levels of the system. And the, the problem about institutional mandates is that they stop people from seeing the system as a whole. They only see their part of the system. There's a lot of talk, particularly in the city, around um, new water supply schemes from groundwater sources, from desalination, etc. But those have very long lead-in times. And the concern is that uh, the more we think that the recent drought was potentially a once-off drought or not to be repeated any time soon, the longer we'll take to uh, press the green light. I think that we need to rethink the relationship with the cost of water uh, and engage in a better form of communication with the public on the cost of water. If you talk about the real price of water in absolute terms, especially in comparison to what you pay for electricity rates, other forms of taxation, water is a very small amount. Um, but it is the most vital utility and resource that we provide. The normal rules of political interaction need to be suspended for those, for those crises in order to have a coherent response. Um, if small 
short term uh, political point scoring continues to uh, to be applied during these crises it's extremely difficult to coordinate the the response and to coordinate the resources to be able to point them in the same direction to respond to that crisis. The cities need to take confidence and courage in trying to lead and not wait for national governments to try to provide the kind of impetus or the framework or the support structures to enable a, a large city of the size of Cape Town to manage its way through the crisis. So what you just saw there was a, a fantastic resource um, from Peter Willis and his team, the Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative. So we've had the benefit of learning how to live with drought. They were in the middle of that drought and they were able to capture that learning and they've shared that for the benefit of us all. So I commend that video to you. Um, there's a huge amount of resource there uh, that we can all learn from. So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Rosa Morales, who's the Director General of the Ministry of Environment from Peru. And she will talk about how Peru is accelerating climate change adaptation following the El Nino floods through the Peru Reconstruction with Change program. Rosa, the platform's yours. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, so, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm Maria Caballero. I'm on behalf of our Director General Rosa Morales. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it, but I will be talking about the experience of Peru in response of El Nino effects, especially in the north coast of our country. Um, so, as you might know Peru is very uh, well recognized by Machu Picchu, but it's not the only one. I mean, it's not the only thing that it's really related to Peru, but it's also um, El Nino, because El Nino event was probably, and the, actually it's the most, pro, the, the most um, uh, let's say, uh, important climate event that we have in Peru was first recognized by local communities in the north coast of Peru. So um, this event is important and is significant because it causes dramatic changes in the weather patterns, in the climate patterns, not just in the country, but globally. And most of the people know that. Uh, but what happened is that in our case, El Nino, causes a lot of losses and damages in, in, in different cities in the country, but especially in the coastal area of Peru. Um, when you look at the, at, the, um, at the map of Peru, you can see that we have this uh, long line of the Andes. And normally when El Nino happens, it affects mostly the western side of the country, where is located the coastal area, and it produces a lot of rainfall, heavy rainfall, in this desertic area. And as you might uh, imagine, this will cause uh, finally these flood events, these mass movements that will destroy houses, will destroy um, agricultural places, um, cities, etc. Et in the other side of the Andes, the eastern side of the Andes, we will have the opposite because we are going to be experimented um, dry conditions, mostly in the Amazon region and the, in the Andes as well. And this, of course, will cause uh, water shortages that will affect again the agricultural systems and also populations. In the last I don't know, 40 years probably since 1982, where we had um, the, one of the most intense El Nino events in Peru. Um, just three events of this extraordinary intensity were recorded. Actually, it's a rather low number, but because of climate change, recent studies are saying that it's expected to have probably more of these extreme uh, El Nino events in the future. So um, I, the El Nino also used to affect ju just the north coast of the country, mainly. But now, 
the, la, the last El Nino in 2017 affected also the central part of the country and, and also the southern part of the country. So that, that means that we have to be prepared for this weather and climate event in the future. Or, and not just in the future, sorry, but now, because we don't know when the next El Nino event of this extraordinary intensity will happen. Uh, we know also that Peru is a highly vulnerable country. I mean, it has this um, diverse uh, biodiversity, I mean, diverse uh, ecological places, but it's also a place where we have these fragile ecosystems. And we have a, a complex geography that at the end will cause a lot of situations that will create this vulnerable setting for climate events to happen and affect adversely the, the populations. Uh, in Peru, more than 50% of the population is exposed to these rainfall, heavy rainfall events, uh, mass movements, floating events as well. And also we have more than 40% of the population that will be mostly affected by droughts. Um, it's important also to consider that these conditions, these climate conditions, these uh, geographical conditions, also add to the poverty that the country faces still now. And also other inequities that we have in the country that in, in the end will put Peru as a highly risk country in terms of climate change, but especially to El Nino. We have urban populations in the coastal area of Peru. And as I said before, these are the mostly affected when an El Nino event happens. Um, these flood events, the mass movements would basically be this kind of hazards that will affect the, these urban settings. And because of the, I mean, the extreme uh, way as they occur, they will cause collapse of infrastructure. They, we will have sanitation uh, service cutoffs. Uh, we have damages on equipment. Uh, public goods will be damaged by these events. We have this uh, interruption of the communication roads and food shortages as well, among others. Um, the last El Nino event that we had in 2017, that was considered as the coastal El Nino event because it was not an event that affected globally, but it was just the, um, just the uh, western side of the South American region. Um, so this event caused approximately uh, effects on probably uh, around uh, 45,000 houses in the north coast of Peru. And most of them, like 90% of them, were um, damages occurring in the urban places. Uh, also, we had almost 23% of these health facilities that were destroyed by, by the event. Therefore, in response of these impacts that we are dealing all over again with each El Nino event, uh, this was a uh, the, it was designed a plan that it's called the Comprehensive Plan for Reconstruction with Changes. And it was prepared as this main input to have a response measure against El Nino, especially. And it was based on the reports and the records in damages, losses made by the sectors, by the municipalities, by the regional governments. In 2020, we had the pleasure to have an agreement extended with the UK government in order to continue with this plant. And actually, because of this agreement, uh, we were promoting the implementation of comprehensive solutions to control these floating events and the mass movements in almost 19 rivers of the country especially in the north coast of the country. So these comprehensive solutions, they had three stages. And there were uh, three because it, it was mainly uh, based for the watersheds. So the watersheds were divided in the upper uh, part of the watershed, the middle and the low part of the watershed. So the first phase was basically to, um, to have these cleaning uh, activities over the rivers and the streams. 
The second one was basically to have implementation of riverbanks and protective measures around the mills places of the watersheds. And the third one was to uh, have this long-term kind of phase that will seek to promote great infrastructure to, pro to protect the, the places that are uh, close to the rivers, but also to promote a natural infrastructure. So this was one of the, the, the let's say, the examples and the experiences the Peruvian government is having in terms of how we are responding to the El Nino impacts. Uh, we are trying with our national adaptation plan and our indices for adaptation to scale up this kind of actions to the national level and to have a better response to climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria Caballero. Uh, and thank you for stepping in at the last moment uh, for Director General Morales. So thank you. Um, the next part of our session will be a dialogue with three cities. So we'll be hearing from Miami, Hull, and Kigali. And so that's a, a dialogue between cities and utilities. So over the past few years, a total of 15 cities have been using the city water resilience approach. And we've heard from Cape Town about lessons learnt where the city water resilience approach has been used to help strengthen urban water resilience and help to design new interventions for the city. We're now going to hear from the three cities who've been involved in city water resilience approach, some of that learning, how they've taken the initiative forward, and perhaps sharing across city to city some of that urban water resilience wisdom. First of all, we'll hear from, from Lee Pitcher from Hull. So Lee, I've got a question. So you've applied the city water resilience approach in Hull. I was just wondering how you activated the community and what role they play in planning urban water resilience for the city and the wider catchment area. Lee. Thanks, Martin. Do you know, when we did our city water resilience assessment, the, the one big thing that overwhelmingly came out as, I guess, not necessarily a gap in terms of how we took things forward, certainly an area where it was going to have to be a constant priority was the way that we engage communities and the way that we engage a whole different demographic of community, uh, a very diverse community right the way across Hull and East Riding. And of course, therefore, in the five key strategic themes of the work that we do, the way that we build community, community resilience, it's right underneath that. It's absolutely vital for us that we get that right because Let's remember, whatever blue-green infrastructure we put in place, whatever the solutions are, where out there, and no matter how innovative they are for the future, we need them to be sustainable. And actually, long gone probably are the days where we are able to create huge, you know, uh, huge big uh, lakes uh, that hold water, for example, or huge tanks under the ground. It's not going to be the case anymore. We are working in cities, cities that are going to have growth, going to have more homes, more houses, and therefore we need to find places where we can uh, hold water, store water, using blue-green solutions at a very, at a much more smaller, granular level, a property level, um, in, the, in the local parks, in the people's gardens that we work with, the residents' gardens. So community resilience is massively important to us. Now, how do you know what to do? Well, actually, it's the data. There is a scientific approach that you can take to, uh, to this, and I think it is about parts and minds. So in terms of minds, it's data, it's understanding the demographic, understanding what the community generally uh, loves and is passionate about. So, for example, we know in Hull, people are really passionate about water, actually. The, the whole place uh, grew from, from, a fishing, you know, from the fishing industry, from a, you know, maritime city, and therefore that narrative and how we loop everything back to uh, where people come from, their legacy, the things that they cherish about their home uh, and what makes them what they are is something that's really key 
to how we then go about our strategy uh, in terms of delivering the stuff that we need to do for delivering water. So that's key. What we also know is the people of Hull, for example, as part of the data that we, that we source, they love to come out to community events. We saw that in 2017 when it was the City of Culture. So we know that people like to get out, they like to engage, and they like to engage face to face. So underpinning what we do is, is, is engagement on a on a one-to-one -one level as much as we possibly can. Now, of course, that's resource intensive um, and, it, and it's just not possible all the time, but as much as we can, that's really key. So what we've done is we spent time with um, volunteers. Um, after the City of Culture, there were, um, and there still are many hundreds of volunteers that support. We've spent time with them. We've carried out masterclasses with them to train them up in terms of the very basics of flood resilience. And when they meet people out at our events, they can talk to them and they put, they're from Hull, they're from the East Riding, and then people relate to those people because they, they're from the place that they're from, they have the same linkages, and therefore they listen, and they want to learn from them. So that's really been really, really important to us. I guess the other thing for me is, is how do you also engage a whole new community of people so the future generations and one way that we've done that is through something called the soak it up initiative so this is where we've worked in partnership for example with the, the yorkshire wildlife trust and we've gone into schools and we worked with the head teachers and the senior leadership team and the teachers and we've worked with the children to look at their playground at the school and we've worked with them to co-create and redesign the playground how we landscape it how we add little ponds to it how we put in rainwater harvesting, how we put in wildflower gardens, all of those things that allow the children to get involved, get a little bit dirty with the, with the, with the earth, be outside, it improves their well-being. It's something that kids absolutely love because they, they, you know, they're getting their hands, getting their sleeves rolled up and they're getting involved. Um, and um, what, what that's allowed us to do is to, in a, in a really fun way, in a really novel way, show the children what can be done, not just to soak up water, but to press carbon, to encourage bees and butterflies, which again, children love, into their school. But then they take that back home with them. And the one great thing about um, engaging with children is that it's almost, it's almost a catalyst for, catalyst for behavior change, because they share that with their parents, and their parents then do the same in their own gardens. So it's just, a, it's just been a, a fantastic way of engaging. For me, the other thing is as well is, you know, we, we really want to create a green, a green economy in Hull and the East Riding, and actually, by the way, across Yorkshire. So actually engaging with children really, really early on and using their passion to think about the kind of, the, the kind of jobs, the kind of roles that they can have, in, can have in the future and inspire them to do something very different in terms of engineering, to bring stem to the forefront once again of schools so that children um, uh, can, can start to think about stem in a different way in a way that actually um, you engineer with nature and that to me is massively important because let's face it the future of uh, not just Hollandese riding but our urban cities is a future where there's going to be a lot more green blue infrastructure so we need we need people to be able to design that we need people to be able to maintain that we need people to be able to communicate that, to engage with the community so that they want to help be part of part of that side, that sustainable urban drainage and support it going forward into the future. Thank you very much, Lee Pitcher from the Living With Water Partnership. Um, fascinating description about engaging, but also mobilizing communities to work towards urban water resilience. And what I was struck also is about bringing young people along on that journey uh, harnessing that power, thinking about the energy that young people have got, and it's their future, uh, and they need to be involved in that. So thank you so much for that, Lee. Um, next, we're going to hear uh, from Miami. So uh, Hardeep Anan from uh, Miami, uh, he's director of um, the One Water Strategy at the Miami-Dade uh, Water and Sewer Department. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Hardeep, over to you. I've got a quick question. Um, so Greater Miami and the Beaches were one of the first cities to develop a, wa a city water resilience 
profile and action plan. So can you tell us some of the learning that you have developed from that process? And can you share with our audience today? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Martin, if you remember, you guys, Eric was integral to that process. So uh, we're very grateful to that, uh, the entire experience we had. It takes me back to the Resilience 305 effort. We're fortunate to be part of the 100 resilient cities. And uh, a parallel effort was ongoing with the city water resilience framework. Uh, we were very happy to five or maybe six or seven countries uh, around the world selected. Uh, what, what we learned is a few takeaways and quite a few of them uh, I want to back on what, uh, what Lee shared. Uh, the first and foremost was that uh, we realized that when we started mapping the stakeholders across the watershed, uh, it looked like a like a cobweb, right? There were there were lines going from one end to the other end, and basically, um, we needed to have a better handle uh, in terms of who our stakeholders are in the watershed from a governance standpoint. And, and then very quickly, as we started peeling that onion back, we started realizing, well, there's so much of data that resides among all of these stakeholders, and and how are we really using this data to enable and to inform? Uh, and to make decisions around our capital around our projects, but most importantly, also communicate with the same variety of stakeholders, uh, the most important of them being uh, the communities we serve, the citizens we serve, our consumers. So that was a lesson learned that we do something, um, and we're still making progress on that front, but at least now we are more aware of it than we were at that point. And, and, and piggybacking on that, Came obvious that we cannot be looking at projects in silos, right? We cannot be looking at planning um, in the various domains of water, like water, wastewater, or groundwater, which is all one water approach came by. And in R305, uh, one of the actions was to, to employ uh, a one water approach. And that, that is what explains my most recent role in the country to kind of enable and, and empower that whole one water conversation. Then came equity. Um, that played a huge part. It is um, she's big on equity and inclusivity, and she's got a whole office um, that is set up to make sure that that plays a whole a, a bigger role uh, in the communities we serve. And uh, there's been an ongoing conversation about innovation and, and kind of disruption of the status quo. If we really have to be aspirational in our goals for uh, 2030 and 2050, uh, we have to think bold and we have to draw insights uh, from from others, from from global uh, successes that are taking place, uh, kind of along the lines of <clears throat> thinking global, uh, but acting local. And then the use of nat the nature based solutions and nature environments and all of the co benefits, all of these things are more consciously being looked at as we embark on that phase. So I'm very hopeful that we will actually take the assessment now and put it into practice and reality as part of my new role um, in the county. Uh, happy to share more as we progress, but those were some of the lessons I would say we, we learned. Hardeep, thank you. Thank you very much for that very insightful um, review of where you've got to with the city water resilience approach in Miami. Our final panelist is uh, Jaffe who's the Chief Resilience Officer from um, the city of Kigali in Rwanda. So uh, welcome, um, Japheth. Um, so the gap from planning action to taking action is very difficult to take. So can you describe how you go about moving from planning to taking positive action to build urban water resilience? Jaffe, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator, for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, uh, we do have many challenges, but also opportunities when it comes to translating our action plans into uh, into uh, real uh, action on the ground. And uh, I wish to share some of the challenges uh, including limited technical capacity and up-to-date data 
to develop uh, bankable programs and projects uh, with sound cost benefit analysis and also compelling cases to attract financing. And this comes in terms of uh, justifying uh, big investments in short term because uh, sometimes it becomes a challenge to justify uh, how the, the projects or program uh, will be uh, relevant in the long run when there is a limited demand in the present. We do also have the challenge related to integrated planning uh, because uh, some of existing funding is directed towards, towards sporadic projects which are not based uh, on comprehensive needs assessment or strategic plans. And uh, in this case, they don't uh, really create a needed impact. And this is also linked to a prior, prior, prioritization of investment, uh, where we face the challenge of inadequate funding you know, the city needs a massive inflow of funding every financial year to meet the increasing demand uh, in, for critical public infrastructure and also uh, services. But these funds are not always readily available in the municipal uh, coffers. So uh, we do have some opportunities that we are targeting right now as we are going through the city resilience assessment process. And uh, some of the tools which I think uh, cities like Kigali could build uh, or could target uh, include uh, these innovative tools, financing tools like uh, municipal bonds, like uh, uh, insurance, uh, water funds, schemes, and, and uh, other tools in place. And earlier today, I mentioned some of the two opportunities that we are uh, targeting, including the Rwanda Green Fund, which is uh, called Fonerwa. This is a fund that uh, help uh, people or institutions to develop bankable ad adaptation projects. And it's a vehicle through which all the climate and environmental finance is channeled, uh, programmed, dispersed, and also monitored. So we are lucky to have this fund uh, close to us. And uh, it's one of the, the opportunity that we have to tap in. We also have the Kigali International Finance Financial Center. This is a new center uh, that aims to transform uh, Rwanda in general into an international financial destination for investors. And it aims to connect African investors and entrepreneurs with uh, the global capital. So uh, cities should uh, look into such kind of opportunities to diversify sources of, source of funds and finances. Uh, and also one other important thing is uh, uh, about capacity building for city planners and engineers who uh, mostly are involved in developing uh, uh, the project that contribute to advance the resilience efforts. So uh, raising their awareness on the existing financing tools uh, is a, a critical thing. And for instance, we do have the Resilient Cities Action Package Program that we are running in partnership with Resilient Cities Network, uh, ICLEI, and GIZ. 
And in, under this program, we conducted such trainings as part of the capacity building that leads to achieving a green and just recovery. These are some of the examples uh, that I can mention, but uh, uh, cities have opportunities that are dormant, and we really need to explore all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeffy, and thank you for joining us from Kigali. So in this session, we've heard some of the learning from Cape Town. We've understood how to deal with and respond to severe water uh, shortages uh, in the middle of a drought. So real some operational learning there. We've heard about Peru and how they're building their resilience across the country. And then we heard from three cities, Hull, Miami and Kigali. And so just to reflect on that, um, what I took away from those, that session really is the, the need for cities, utilities, governments to take positive leadership steps in looking at urban water resilience. We need to be able to articulate a compelling vision for urban water resilience and take people along that journey there's the power of collaboration and partnerships. We heard about that and the importance of that. And engaging communities and the young in helping to develop an urban water resilient future. And lastly, it's the importance about sharing learning. So this session for me is all about sharing. So we can learn from each other, from different cities, perhaps facing different challenges, but often the root causes to developing a stronger urban water resilience are very similar. So I'd like to thank our speakers and hand on to our next moderator, Louise Ellis from Arup, who will take us through to the next part of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'm going to start the second part of this session, uh, and it's my great privilege to start it um, with a video from Dr. Mojis Tedes. Uh, he is Addis Ababa's uh, chief resilience officer, and he's going to discuss the challenges that Addis faces uh, in relation to water and uh, the steps that they've taken in the development of their water resilience profile and action plan. Uh, after the video, I'm going to hand over, and this is a warning, uh, Roger uh, and uh, Seth, I'm going to be then handing over to you to talk about the profile. Over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mogus Tadesa. I'm working in the Addis Ababa City Resilience Project Office as a Chief Resilience Project Officer. Today, I am glad that I will be introducing you all about the Disabas Water Resilience Journey. One of the key steps in building city water resilience is to carry out a city water resilience assessment. The purpose of conducting city water resilience assessment is to establish a resilience profile of risks and vulnerabilities in the city to identify areas of intervention to enhance the resilience of urban water systems and also to identify high water consumers and prioritize them for a targeted intervention in the future. Conducting city water resilience assessment has multiple benefits. One of the benefits is it helps reduce water consumption in the future, and also it helps in promoting alternative use of water sources, and in order to develop and implement the water conservation programs, and finally, to promote an accelerated water supply investment in the city. Addis Ababa is facing a number of challenges, from extending water and sanitation services for growing population to managing risks of watershed degradation and the competing water demands outside city jurisdictions. One among the ten stresses of Addis Ababa city is water shortage, which is a critical challenge to the city of Addis Ababa. As a result, it is mandatory to have a reliable water supply both now and for the future. These challenges has necessitated the importance of building resilience to water shocks and stresses in the context of climate action for the city of Addis Ababa as well as worldwide. Therefore, in order to tackle water-related challenges and to help communities survive and thrive through sustainable, adaptive, and resilient urban water systems, 
The collaborative action of all development partners is found to be of paramount importance. This is all what I have for today regarding Addis Ababa's water resilience journey. Thank you so much all for your attention. Have a nice time. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Mojas. Um, I'm now going to hand over and I would like to introduce uh, Roger Vandenberg. He's the Acting Global Director at the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities, along with Seth, Seth Schultz, a CEO of the Resilient Shift. Uh, and they have a very exciting announcement uh, to make today. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much. Uh, and first, I want to thank you for organizing this great session and thank Arab, the Resilient Shift, uh, the Resilient Cities Network to really kind of partner in this important work on building this kind of water resilience in, uh, in, in, in cities. So today, and we heard Dr. Mojis talking about the journey that he undertook. And I'm very happy. And I'm very happy. Um, I'm very happy that we are able today to announce and and, and launch uh, the actual finalization of the city water resilience assessment. And I will uh, I will let um, uh, Seth talk a little bit more about that. But um, so that's what we're going to launch. I'm, I'm very proud that we have been doing that together. And I just want to say a couple of things because it's a very dynamic process that has a kind of very structured methodology and that's really needed at the moment to work with the i mean the complexity of cities that these cities are facing we've heard so we need that structured methodology with the many partners in the cities to come to that broad approach to water that is very important i think um, with the ross center we have been um, insisting uh, and we have been learning from each other um, by and we've been introducing a couple of new elements a very spatial analysis that's kind of being integrated in the in the development so that you can develop a more place-based approach and also social economic vulnerability assessment so that you can put equity at the center when you start implementing the outcomes of the assessment into action so it resulted um, as dr mogus said in a, a a set of visions nine visions that came out of the uh, city water resilience assessment i'm not going to go over all of them don't 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 worry but it's around it includes the many aspects of water that are relevant in cities. city. It's water access for businesses, for the most vulnerable. It's about supply. It's about data collection. It's about um, sanitation, stormwater management, to, to mention a couple examples. Um, and it's great that it comes with 34 discrete actions, because action is what we needed. And last, and don't worry, Louise, I'm finishing now. So as part of the Urban Water Resilience Initiative, um, we've been very happy that we've been able to use this methodology to enrich it and now to link it to the other components of the Urban Water Resilience Initiative in Africa, which is finance, is mentioned already, and coalitions. And I hope later um, in the session to talk a little bit more on, uh, about that. So over to you, Seth. You. Um, and and uh, just to add, just to add to that, so I'm Seth Schultz, um, the CEO of the Resilient Shift, and also very grateful to be here. Um, and just building off of a few of the points uh, that were just made, I think what's exciting about this project is now we're, we're this is number 15. And this is number 15, uh, and we started this two, three years ago. So the ability for us to replicate this experiment, learn from the past process, and what this is all about, you know, tools are only as good as how they're used and what you put into them. And the key thing that this drives is a conversation. It drives awareness at the local level and it brings stakeholders together so they become aware of things that they weren't before. And then you can start making decisions, you can gamify things, you can prioritize things, but at the heart of this, this is a tool built around collaboration amongst partners in this room. Thanks, to, you, you, you did a great job thanking all the partners, but also to, to the World Resources Institute for this partnership and how we've been able to learn, a, apply that forward, but then create that level, that foundational level of integration and coordination at the municipal and at the broader regional level as we're looking at, at the watershed. So I'll leave it at there, Louise, but uh, really exciting to be here. Very happy that we've just launched this profile on Audis and looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much, Seth, uh, and thank you, Roger. I'm going to ask you to stay, Roger. Seth, you are welcome to run to your next event. Thank you very much for sticking around.
Um, I'm going to invite up to join uh, Roger uh, Henk Ovink, who's a special envoy um, for the water for the Netherlands, uh, along with Carlos Diaz uh, from uh, the International Water Association. Uh, and we're also going to be joined online by Tizgira Rida uh, Abraham uh, from WaterAid. Uh, in today's uh, roundtable, to close out this session, we're going to be talking about the all-important accelerating action. Uh, we've heard a lot today about some of the lessons learned from uh, cities and utilities around resilience, and now we're going to talk about how we move forward. Henk, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to make sure you have some mics between you. Henk, the Water as Leverage program has worked across the cities of Chennai, Kulna, Samarang. What are the success factors that you found for building resilience in collaboration with the cities? And what is next for Water as Leverage? Thanks so much. Um, and and um, great to hear the, the, the progress, um, uh, Rogier and uh, Seth. Um, and thanks, Arab, for hosting us here uh, on uh, Cities Day at uh, the Climate COP in the Water Pavilion. So we, I think that's the, the that's more or less also the core of uh, Water as Leverage. Um, you asked about the success and the follow-up. The success of Water as Leverage is that in the context of this emerging climate crisis in our cities around the world, where we know where when we focus on cities in Asia, we're at the very forefront, uh, the front line of where that crisis hits most and then the most vulnerable first and uh, biggest. I think the, the, the first ingredient of that success was to take a little pause, not like a real pause, but to take a little pause to create a space, place and environment to come together. because. Yes, action is needed, but what we see around the world is that we drive action first before thinking. And that what we see is single-focused, stupid infrastructure projects rippling and crippling our economies across the world. So what Water as Leverage did first was embrace the need for taking that pause and letting people and their institutions come together. And that was across communities, individuals, informal, uh, organizations, governments, businesses, local investors, but also global partners like UN Habitat, WWF, 100 Resilient Cities, now the Resilient Cities Network, um, um, uh, governments and financial institutes, the OECD, uh, World Bank, and so forth. So this was a this mix of partners that normally don't come together. We created an environment to bring them together. And then when we had them in this pause, then we gave a kick. Because eh? this was not about you know, slowing down, this was about speeding up and scaling up. Bringing them together, so that was one, really created the opportunity out of an understanding, and I heard they say, uh, across, out of the underst a systems understanding of interdependencies needs, focusing on opportunities where in these cities where everything comes together, where are the hotspots to intervene? And what it is then to catalyze action? Systems understanding by collaboration helped us really pinpoint those actions that could have a ripple effect. So pause, come together, forge a coalition across everything and then identify those interventions where speed and scale all of a sudden are prominent. Identifying those opportunities, we came also with validation and evaluation. Because for any investor, public or private, you need to understand what the value of your investment will be. And in cities and in the context of climate and sustainability, equity and uh, water, that value add not always comes at the short term so it is a you know it is a business case where you need to incorporate that long term and having that now we have over 27 of those opportunities in these three cities Chennai in India 
Kulna in Bangladesh and Samarang in Indonesia, where already right now, as we are speaking, in Chennai, the first pilot is being implemented, connected to a Green Climate Fund project uh, with the World Bank and Asian Development Bank, uh, Dutch foundations and others. We're scaling up the uh, KFW from Germany. We're scaling up those projects in these three cities. And then I come to, the, uh, to your second question. The follow-up is also the success. Because it works and because we uh, start small, uh, but also because those opportunities have the, opportuni uh, you have the capacity to be scaled and replicated. We now also start in Vietnam along the coast with the World Bank. Uh, along the Ganges with the India Green Ganga program, uh, exploring opportunities as, as here today in Bangkok, um, starting in Israel, uh, a resilient by design challenge, uh, in Africa together with exploring a partnership with WRI and the Ross Center for Resilient Cities, um, working in uh, Colombia and even in Europe uh, together with Germany and Denmark exploring how to scale this. And this is the other factor of scale. In the cities, you need to identify what helps us deliver change and the opportunity for replication and scale. But it's also the process of coming together, forging coalitions, identifying opportunities that really deliver the change we seek. That process also demands scale. And that's to my last point. We see around the world the investments that make us more vulnerable and increase climate change. That's the majority. But in the minority, we find maximum opportunity of people coming together, forging coalitions and focusing on those innovations that really, really matter to their lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable first. That is what we need to scale. That's a 1% of our investments right now. Uh, but I think it's four steps to the majority. From one to two is a doubling of our effort. From two to four and four to 16, and then we're almost done. And I think water is leverage, as with so many other investments, there's no silver bullet, but it is you know, inspiring me in the work we're doing around the world, has that opportunity to create that kind of scale. Thank you very much, Hank, and on inspiring, you always inspire us um, with your great uh, presentations and discussions in this topic, and I was uh, scribbling frantically during your speech to try and uh, capture some of those great learning points. Um, Roger, I'm going to move over to you now and, and first congratulate you on the release of your first uh, Water Resilience Action Plan in Africa uh, and ask the question, uh, what do you see as the key opportunities to improve water resilience with cities across Africa? Uh, and how is the African Urban Water Resilience Initiative mobilizing action? Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Louise. So I think this is an exciting conversation and especially hearing, you know, Jafet in Kigali and Dr. Mogus in, in others um, telling how they, it's a journey that you're on in bringing all these actors together in kind of creating something that's substantial enough and that has a sign off in order to move forward into action. So thanks for the congratulations because that, you know, the, 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 the resilience action plan is a core of the things that we are doing. Um, and thanks for the partnership there. So there are three points I want to make. One is on the relevance of that new approach, a new approach that we agree on. The second on that the shift in practice and a coalition that we need to build. And the third is on, uh, the third is on, on, on finance. So let me say first a couple of things on that approach. So the City Water Resilience Assessment is part of a bigger approach that we introduce that is place-based that identifies vulnerabilities, that overlays risks, that give the right data sets to city decision makers and actors to say, this is what we need to invest in. And we often talk about the bankability of a project, but the key question is what are the right projects to invest in? So we do the data analytics, we create that opportunity to, with all the actors in the city, to have that real understanding of a system. And cities are not necessarily, in terms of water management and water resilience, cities are not always equipped for doing that. Eh? Because water, as many here, because it's the water pavilion, there's many water, and I'm sitting next to the international envoy of water. 
So um, I need, he knows a lot about water, much more than I do. But um, the thing is that, you know, cities don't have that, are not equipped to, to work on water often, only on a portion of water. But we see cities, and especially in Africa, growing so rapidly that they are organizing, reorganizing, and rethinking their role and responsibility of securing water for everyone. And water for everyone is also complex in the, in the African context, because in the in African cities, because we have a lot of informal and poor and vulnerable communities that rely on water accessibility by private, sometimes by even mobster uh, um, uh, uh, reality. So how to equip cities is to bring this new approach, bring different partners together, give them that kind of the assessment and a good identification of key actions to undertake. So that's the first thing. The second thing that is very relevant to understand is that, and, and, and Jafet mentioned it already, is the limited capacity, the limited technical expertise that is there in cities. Um, so that coalition building, that building of a, an, around an agenda, building a coalition, building a movement that can say, we need to do water differently. We can't look only at water access, we can't look only at climate, we can't look only at water resource management. We need to bring that together in that approach. And we need to agree on a set of priorities. And then collectively, you know, a call to actions to financial institutions, to national authorities to support them in that journey. So that's the second. And the last thing is that, of course, and also we hear it from the people that are day to day working with it, that lack of finance. And part of the Urban Water Resilience Initiative is the development of a catalytic fund, a fund that can connect the actions identified through that new approach and supported by that coalition um, into actual kind of financial investments. And that is super important. And I want to say one, one more thing about that because that fund looks at a piece of kind of venture capital in which it is going to support the new, the good things that have not been supported yet and look through a mechanism then how we can scale it and then bring in kind of the, 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 the bigger uh, financial institution. And that is very important because what we see right now that many, we assess the many financial and investment projects that are going on in the, uh, uh, on the continent. Too much is done, too much downstream and too piecemeal. So this fund says let's test based on the assessment, this new kind of stuff that test it and test it, do it in two or three cities. And the wa Urban Water Resilience Initiative is currently ongoing in six cities. Let test it, let test it. And once we figure out how to fix it, then we scale it up. And hopefully that movement that we're creating, that shift in practice movement can help us then to bring that to other cities. So that's, the, um, that's the, pretty much the whole journey that we are on. But not only us, actually the people that you saw on the screen they do the real work, um, and we thank you for your collaboration in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Hank. What connects us here is that uh, funding comes in two ways. Funding comes in the way that it seeks opportunities, and then too often it's the opportunity we don't want to be funded. And what Rogier is also saying, uh, what the catalytic fund is aimed at is those interventions that really s make the difference and it, it's true also for the water's leverage approach but there's this other need for funding and it is really aimed at you know a minimal amount so we need the billions for the these these projects that really are going to make a difference but we also have to secure in our funding, the millions for research, for capacity, for an enabling environment, for coming together, for coalitions, for governance, for um, the most marginalized, for this capacitating of people. And that's often a sliver if you compare it to the millions and trillions we spent on infrastructure, but it's more harder to find. So I think what Rogier and the team uh, are doing is and what Water as Leverage is doing is securing that that is guaranteed. Yeah, that we can work with you and experts and communities and bring them together and build trust and an enabling environment to be able to identify that. But it's harder to get. So there's also a call in this to the financial sector, public and private, never fund a project without funding the process. Never, fun never secure a billion without securing a million. 
because it's people that come first before we're ever able to invest in those projects. And I think that's also a binding factor. Thank you very much, Hank. And a, a really important point there that the millions are needed to, to determine which are the right solutions to spend the billions on. And you've given me a really nice segue uh, to, to Skiri Raider uh, Abraham from WaterAid. Um, welcome to the session. Uh, WaterAid is focusing on this holistic approach to improving access to climate finance. What are the challenges around accessing climate finance and how is the resilient water accelerator unlocking them? Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this uh, uh, call, actually, this session. It's great to see the water sector coming together at COP uh, through the Water Pavilion as part of the adaptation work. It's really great to see that. But second, um, it's important that we start to see this collaboration on the ground and what does it mean uh, to, to be collaborating um, to design programs to tackle whole water systems. Uh, so that communities on the front line of the climate challenge can access clean water uh, close to home and all year round. So this is very important. Uh, and as it was mentioned earlier, through the Prince of Wales Sustainable Market uh, Initiative, WaterAid is actually collaborating with a number of organizations uh, through the Resilient Water Accelerator uh, to ensure water services are fit for the future. So this is a uh, uh, high uh, impact uh, collaboration that we are having. Um, so working in urban areas in particular is, is very important uh, since this is often where a range of climate threats and water security challenges intersect. We are already working in Maputo, in Lagos on those issues and also building a strong collaboration with different institutions such as the World Resource Institute Urban Water Resilience Initiative uh, which is also potentially overlap with the resilient water accelerator in different countries, uh, such as in Ethiopia, we work with different cities on uh, climate resilience, water safety planning in more than uh, 20 towns. So there are a number of initiatives that water aid is having with cities. Um, last week, we launched the latest phase of the accelerator at COP in partnership with the UK the Dutch and the Swedish governments, and also with a, a number of other partners, such as the African Development Bank, uh, different countries, uh, Nigeria and Bangladesh. Uh, we are also trying to get uh, to engage uh, other countries like Ethiopia and Madagascar too. Uh, so the uh, Resilient Water Accelerator, as many of you might know, brings together governments, private sector industry experts, CSOs, to harness funds uh, and water expertise. And so targeting to, to kickstart with an estimated 600, uh, 600 million USD in the first uh, five years, uh, which is quite ambitious. We have had commitments of funding from a number of donors yet, and as well as pledges of technical support from different uh, organizations such as Arup. It, it's important to, to have both the funding and, and the technical support uh, to be able to design programs and financial designs of this program have to be right. Uh, so to design the right programs, not just raise the, the funds. Um, so this is very important. And I would just highlight uh, the case of Ethiopia, how much financial gap uh, in uh, in uh, climate resilience wash in, in wash um, with regards to climate is very important. Uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, it's recognized, it's one of the countries that recognize that water is very critical. Um, it's a very critical line of defense against the impact of climate change. But there is very limited access to climate financing for WASH, uh, specifically for WASH and uh, adaptation in general. Um, so we, we did a situational analysis very um, recently conducted. Uh, we looked at the financing for, for the WASH sector. So financing for WASH is only expected to be done by um, not the climate uh, sector or the environment or the climate sector, but the respective ministries uh, of water. So they are the only ones raising funds uh, for, for WASH uh, related to, to climate. Uh, there's one uh, program, the One WASH National Program, which is a multi-stakeholder program uh, that has started allocating fund funding for uh, climate resilient WASH since 2019. Um, and around 30% of the One WASH National Program is for climate resilience WASH actually, both urban uh, and rural um, investment. So the climate resilience WASH programming is, is actually nowadays uh, around uh, 42 in 42 districts and funding has actually uh, increased. It has more than uh, tripled 
over the years from 19 uh, from 2019 to to now and 30% of the funding is actually uh, covered by the government of Ethiopia so there's there's a prioritization by by governments and key donors uh, for the climate resilience program uh, the World Bank, uh, which covers around 65%, um, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, around 28% of, of that funding, and the Korea International Cooperation Agency, and UNICEF. As, as I mentioned, uh, the budget is still very low. Uh, that's where the uh, programs initiatives like the Accelerator come in, and we really need to change the way uh, financing for the sector is coming. and the way the programs is designed. Um, so I, I am happy, uh, we are happy to share more on, on the water climate accelerator and uh, I'm happy to uh, also, uh, this is what we can share uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and to change tack slightly, but maybe actually not that slightly, uh, I think Henk mentioned at the start uh, the importance of capacity building. Uh, and we're joined today by Carlos Diaz from the International Water Association. Uh, professionals working at the utility city and basin scale uh, are at the forefront of climate um, action and smart water management. How are you equipping professionals with the skills and the knowledge to deliver resilient water and wastewater services in a very uncertain future? Yes, thank you, Luis. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here on behalf of the International Water Association. And this is more about capacity and uh, knowledge exchange. Uh, so I will reframe a bit the, the, the question. No, this is a, how does IWA help accelerating action in water utilities, in water resilience, sorry. Uh, I believe our work with utilities and utility professionals, the second largest community in our membership, because we are a membership association, right, is central to this, is central. For example, with the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative, we encourage them to start paying attention to the topic, to this topic, assisting them to generate knowledge and more important, to disseminate it. Uh, this is the main support that IWA as a professional association can provide to the water sector to accelerate action in water resilience. Uh, earlier, I presented the initiative, so I don't want to be repetitive, uh, the recognition program that is also, that is being designed around it and the logic behind. Uh, furthermore, I announced in the afternoon uh, that we are working together with CDP and Aguas Andinas from Chile to incorporate the 50 to 1 campaign into our recognition program. And we are full speed with that. In a nutshell, the recognition program is the carrot component of the initiative, aiming at stimulating utilities to start reflecting on their own situation while reporting on the journey to become climate smart. The initiative aimed to support utilities in improving their climate resilience, meaning planning for adaptation, while at the same time contributing to carbon emission reduction, the, the mitigation part, okay? Um, the initiative is built around four pillars. Knowledge, knowledge generation and sharing, and sharing, web presence for external outreach, leadership, and a vision and recognition program to encourage the utilities to start paying attention to the topic. To date, we already have in place, thanks to Corinne, you know Corinne, most of you, the community of practices on mitigation and adaptation, we have a, a, you know, a, a huge community from water utilities and, and water professionals. The web present is already built. This is also our repository of information and is hosting the ECAM tool because this is a heritage program from the work that we did with GIZ on the Wacklin project. And the leadership community platform for utility leaders to get peer support. That is also very important. And as I said, we are right now designing the recognition program around the vision that has been developed in consultation with our steering committee and has been already shared with our utility leaders for endorsement. 
This will play a central role in our utility engagement program at the next IWA World Water Congress and Exhibition that is happening in Copenhagen next September. Uh, a sneak preview on the recognition program, very quickly, it will assess several components aligned to the vision. GSG emission management based on the ECAM tool developed as part of the Wackling project with GIZ. Sorry. Planning, focusing on adaptation, assessing to which extent the utility is incorporating climate-related risk into their planning for business continuity, and leadership, evaluating if the utility is playing a local, regional, or international role, championing on this topic. I believe this is IWA's two cents to empower utilities to act on climate resilience. If it is true that water is a key element of the race to resilience, then water utility, doesn't matter if in Peru or in the Netherlands, are key agents for the implementation of cities' race to resilience plans. And therefore, coordination between utilities are their political principles is essential. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you to all our speakers, Hank, Roger, Carlos, and Tuscariga. Uh, we've heard today about the importance of collaboration, the importance of financing, not just the billions, but also the millions for planning, the importance of data and spatial analysis uh, in order to inform the solutions and make sure that they are bankable, uh, to Roger's point, and finally, the importance of capacity building. I have the privilege and slightly unenviable task, uh, both of um, wrapping up and trying to sum up a full day of activity. Uh, we started at 9 a.m. this morning, Henk and I have been going a long time, uh, discussing the role of water in spatial planning for climate action. We then covered net zero circular water and had a packed afternoon full of urban water adaptation and resilience, covering the provision of essential water and sanitation services as well as the protection of, of citizens and communities from water-related shocks and stresses. If you permit me, I'm gonna try and boil it down into five key themes for the day. And they kept changing during the panel discussion, so I'm blaming you guys for being on the ad lib. <laughs> The first is that uh, cities, whilst being some of the main causes of climate change, will also be the most effective, affected, sorry, and the quality of cities, their scale, their pragmatism, their role in innovation and creativity, and their global international networks and cooperation offer great opportunities to accelerate climate action. The second and we've heard this in all of our sessions, that water needs to be seen as an opportunity and not a problem. It's a, it's a golden thread that links human health, economic development, urban placemaking, and culture and heritage. Finally, oh, sorry, the third one, we've got two more to go. Um, cities are really complex systems, and building resilience is about understanding those systems and about building capacity, and that's a human component. It's about building trust across disciplines between the private and the public sector and involving communities and grassroots organizations. And we heard some great tangible examples from places like Hull of how to do that. The fourth is that place-based approaches and getting the data and spatial analysis right involving financiers at the beginning of projects are all key to bridge that gap from planning through to implementation. And finally, my final one for Carlos, uh, the importance of capacity building and peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think we've had a full day of sessions today where we've really lived that out and had cities from around the world all learning from each other. So I'm gonna close by saying that together we can accelerate action on water and climate. And it's a wrap, go get a drink everyone. Thank you.